Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm David Birkeland. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist uh, for Texas Cardiac Arrhythmia. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Coulter and the organizers for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, I've been asked to talk about what the evidence tells us for timing of AFib ablations, and this is actually a very relevant topic um, and a great time to discuss it as there's been a flurry of recent high-quality trials and meta-analysis aimed at answering just this question. And so far, the answer seems to be the sooner the better, uh, but we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, I have no relevant disclosures. Uh, and I'll start by asking, uh, why do we care about atrial fibrillation? So firstly, it, it is the most common arrhythmia seen in clinical practice, and it's becoming increasingly common as the general population ages, with the prevalence projected to be over 12 million by 2030 just in the U.S. alone. Recent studies have shown that the estimated lifetime risk for developing AFib for individuals currently in their 40s and 50s is 22 to 26 percent. So there's about a one in four chance if you're currently in your 40s and 50s that you will develop AFib in your lifetime, which is just staggering. Uh, and beyond the high prevalence, uh, AFib is expensive. Uh, acute care of AFib patients accounts for about 1% of the overall healthcare cost with uh, greater than $37 billion per annum. And uh, even 20 years ago, the average AFib patient cost the healthcare system $7,000 per year, uh, which has no doubt gone up since that time. So uh, we've established that AFib presents a huge problem. Uh, so why does early aggressive intervention make sense? Um, primarily because we've known for decades that AFib begets AFib. And this is primarily due to electrical and structural remodeling that begins to occur very early in the course of atrial fibrillation, favoring maintenance of AFib over sinus rhythm. So uh, studies have shown that with even, uh, within even uh, 24 hours, uh, you can see the atrial refractory period decreases significantly, which means that the atrium is able to be depolarized more rapidly uh, which it allows for, uh, you know, more rapid activation. And this favors uh, reentry reentrant currents, which are thought to be a major driving mechanism and sustaining mechanism of atrial fibrillation. And we also know that structural remodeling occurs quite quickly. Um, histological studies have shown that even by three to four months, the normal relationship between atrial cardiomyocytes and the fibroblast seen at the top left is progressively distorted with the presence of uh, uh, myofibroblast, fibrous deposits, and this disrupted extracellular matrix. And so the, the effect of uh, this remodeling is that AFib becomes less about its triggering mechanism from these focal rapid firings within the pulmonary veins and more of a, a structural problem uh, dependent on sustaining factors such as inflammation, fibrosis, and oxidative stress, which eventually leads AFib to permanently supplant sinus rhythm. And, and this is borne out well with the evidence uh, with, with the 2014 DECAF trial um, uh, demonstrating that among patients with atrial fibrillation undergoing catheter ablation, increasing burden of atrial fibrosis estimated by cardiac MRI, a uh, scar shown here by the green areas contrasted with the healthy blue areas, was independently associated with AF recurrence. Um, and so you can see that uh, uh, AF recurrence is, is quite low in stage one atria, which are less than 10% total scar, uh, about 18% uh, over a, a year and a half after ablation versus in uh, patients with very high scar burden um, in the stage four, where the recurrence is, is close to 70% uh, within, within about a year and a half post ablation. So taking a step back, uh, what exactly are we doing in an AFib ablation? So uh, a, a seminal study in 1998 by Dr. Hasegar demonstrated that AFib tends to arise from abnormal automaticity or rapid firing, which we mentioned earlier, within the pulmonary veins, giving rise to the idea of pulmonary vein triggers. And he found that over 90% of AFib originated from these pulmonary vein triggers, which provides a meaningful target. And you can see these are your uh, pulmonary veins looking here at the, at the posterior uh, left atrium. So uh, the early attempts um, at AFib ablation involved directly mapping and targeting the pulmonary vein triggers themselves. So the ablation catheter was direct uh, advanced into the pulmonary veins and these uh, multiple foci were identified and burned 
um, directly, regardless of how far into the veins they were found. And it, it was uh, quickly discovered that veins don't take very well to burning at all and often respond to all that tissue architecture disruption by developing a severe stenosis, which you can see on a CT in these areas here. And this is a, a, a devastating complication um, and causes uh, refractory pulm pulmonary hypertension with very, very few treatment options. Um, so subsequently, uh, uh, we gradually moved away from burning inside the pulmonary veins to uh, either burning or freezing around the ostea of the veins, which uh, significantly improved the rate of pulmonary vein stenosis, but didn't entirely eliminate it. And so we've since moved to uh, a wide area circumferential ablation or, or WACA as it's referred to outside of the pulmonary veins, which is our modern technique that leaves the uh, venous tissue near and inside the ostea untouched. So getting back to the question at hand, uh, let's take a look at one of the influential studies published from last year. So this is a trial at a Duke um, headed by Dr. Pacini. Um, it's a meta-analysis of six large observational studies of about 5,000 patients total that look specifically at ablation success rates relative to diagnosis to time of ablation. So in patients undergoing ablation uh, within less than one year from time of diagnosis, there was a 27% relative risk reduction in AFib uh, recurrence compared to those undergoing ablation greater than one year out from diagnosis. <clears throat> and uh, you can see that, that data here. So uh, uh, p-value is, is less than 0 0.001 and the overall effect is uh, 0.73. And this um, holds true as we uh, look at the same outcomes in patients undergoing ablation. Uh, within three years from the time of diagnosis versus greater than three uh, years with a similar risk reduction rate. Um, these results are highly suggestive that there are early benefits um, to addressing AFib with ablation and that earlier rather than later tends to hold true at various points from initial diagnosis. And uh, however, this analysis, it, this is a compilation of observational studies and, and suffers from the same uh, bias limitations you expect from these types of observational trials. So what do the randomized control trials show? Um, so the ATTEST trial uh, published just this year was an international multicenter randomized control trial looking at patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation at high risk of progression. So that means the inclusion criteria looked specifically at patients who were greater than two years out from their initial diagnosis and having already attempted at least one class one or class three antiarrhythmic drug. And uh, the study was actually terminated early due to slow enrollment, but still managed to meet statistical significance with only 255 of the planned 322 patients completing three-year follow-up. So uh, among the major takeaways from the trial was that patients treated with RF ablation were 10 times less likely to develop persistent atrial fibrillation than those treated with antiarrhythmic drugs uh, over a three-year period. You can see how flat this uh, ablation curve is relative to the antiarrhythmic over those three years. And um, uh, Dr. Andrade uh, published another significant randomized control trial out of Canada also this year uh, called Early AF that looked at not just earlier ablations, but first line ablations. And uh, uh, about 300 patients with symptomatic paroxysmal new onset AFib were assigned to either first line cryotherapy or antiarrhythmic drug therapy for rhythm control. The primary endpoint was the first documented recurrence of any type of atrial arrhythmia, including AFib, atrial flutter, or atrial tachycardia. And this was a somewhat different trial because all patients underwent loop recorder implants at the time of procedure to establish continuous monitoring rather than the usual spot check, EKG, or event monitor uh, that's been done with so many of these uh, uh, prior ablation uh, trials. And so th this is a much more strenuous outcome assessment, but, but at the same time, much more useful and descriptive. And so uh, what was found was that first line ablation significantly improved upon the primary endpoint. Uh, about 60% of patients were free from any arrhythmia at one year versus only about 30% of patients on uh, anti-arrhythmic drug therapy uh, for a number needed to treat of, of about four. And uh, in, in addition, 
um, first line ablation also reduced total AFib burden with a, with a median burden of 0%, as well as uh, produced meaningful improvements in quality of life and symptoms. Uh, and it bears mentioning that, uh, that there were similar adverse event rates between the antiarrhythmic drugs and cryoablation in this trial. Uh, however, this was a relatively short trial. Uh, Follow-up was only one year, so it really didn't allow for any evaluation of long-term benefits such as progression of AFib to persistent uh, or permanent or any kind of major cardiovascular adverse event. So this left uh, this trial does leave a lot of important questions unanswered. And uh, the, these results were, were nearly duplicated with the very similar uh, STOP AF trial. This is also an international multicenter randomized controlled trial looking at initial cryoablation versus antiarrhythmic drug. Also had 12 month follow up. There was a, a few less patients at about 200 versus the 300. And the primary efficacy endpoint was recurrence of asymptomatic arrhythmia between that three month blanking period that's standard at the beginning of these trials and the one year follow up. So the, the results were very similar. Um, There's a dramatic relative risk reduction uh, with ablation compared to anti arrhythmics, uh, an absolute risk reduction of about 30%. Um, so again, uh, a very, very low number needed to treat. And, and while these trials did show clear benefit in effective rhythm control, they're again, not powered, um, nor do they have long enough uh, uh, follow-up to determine long-term major, uh, major cardiovascular benefits. And so for, for more long-term analysis, uh, we look to the EAST AF net trial, which uh, Dr. Razavi will, will go into more detail shortly. But in brief, the trial looked at a composite of death, stroke, heart failure, and acute coronary syndrome hospitalization and found that aggressive rhythm control, including ablation or antiarrhythmic drug, uh, resulted in a 21% relative risk reduction to the usual approach of symptom-based care, uh, primarily cent centered upon rate control. So very few of the patients in the, uh, <clears throat> in the usual care group got an antiarrhythmic drug. And uh, the trial was actually stopped early at the third interim analysis doing, uh, due to the uh, efficacy being met. A medium follow-up was 5.1 years. Um, also very interestingly, these benefits appeared to apply equally to those patients who are asymptomatic at enrollment, and they made up about 30% of the trial. And this was looked at in, in a post hoc analysis just published in the European Heart Journal about a month ago, um, specifically looking at symptomatic versus asymptomatic patients. And <clears throat> You can see that the uh, data trends between the symptomatic and asymptomatic patients mirror each other uh, with similar reduction in the uh, composites mentioned of death, stroke, heart failure, and ACS hospitalization. Um, while, of course, neither separate group was powered to reach statistical significance, uh, they did follow the same curve. And so, so at a minimum, these results certainly warrant further investigation into the subset of asymptomatic patients. So. Uh, what do the guidelines say about first line ablation uh, upon AFib diagnosis? So um, even in 2017, before any of these studies were published, guidelines uh, recognize populations where AF is deemed to be a reasonable first line therapy. As so in particular, symptomatic patients with either paroxysmal or persistent AFib or patients with uh, atrial fibrillation and heart failure with reduced uh, ejection fraction. And the guideline committee specifically commented that um, following the standard route of multiple antiarrhythmic drug trials, cardioversion allows for further development of atrial fibrosis and a shift in complexity of management that favors substrate modification over the trigger targeting that Hassegger uh, uh, suggested all those years ago. So, um, these, uh, these earlier studies are aimed at, at answering the question of what do we do with symptomatic symptomatic atrial fibrillation. Um, but we're, we're entering this new age of screening with highly dependable wearable cardiac monitors becoming more and more available. Um, and, and these monitors are actually quite effective in detecting atrial fibrillation with single lead smartphone apps and, and continuous monitoring smartwatches demonstrating sensitivities and specificities in the high 90s. Um, but what, what do we do with these patients when they're found? Uh, does earlier the better mantra that we talked about earlier, does this apply to patients with asymptomatic AFib? And uh, it, it's, it's a legitimate question to ask given that studies have shown that one in three new AFib cases are diagnosed after AFib hospitalizations in patients below the age of 75, and one in five patients suffer a stroke before AFib is detected. 
So clearly, uh, asymptomatic is not equal to benign. This tells us that too many undiagnosed AFib cases are slipping by routine care and that downstream consequences are not always preceded by symptoms. Uh, so no one would argue the value of uh, unco uh, uncovering undiagnosed AFib, but with increased screening comes increased cost, increased burden to the patient and anxiety, unnecessary testing, sometimes unnecessary procedures. Uh, there's increased burden to the clinician, the healthcare system in general. And, you know, the, the argument for broader screening is, is uh, out of the scope of this presentation, but it will most certainly be a focus of studies in the near future. Um, and, and finally, it's important to remember that while catheter fibrillation is the gold standard for rhythm management in atrial fibrillation, it's only one part of the total approach, uh, which includes patient education, modifiable risk factor control, and a, a multidisciplinary approach, uh, um, among other things. So um, in conclusion, uh, evidence suggests that many patients stand to benefit from first-line ablation therapy, and this is likely due to uh, heading off atrial fibrosis. Um, that inflammation, that the toxic spiral of oxidative stress that shifts pathogenesis of atrial fibrillation from triggering mechanisms to sustaining. Um, ablation can actually decrease the cost of uh, healthcare for patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, updated guidelines support first line ablative therapy as a reasonable approach to either paroxysmal or persistent AFib patients with the appropriate choice, benefit, and risk. And uh, <clears throat> These trials do not adequately inform us on how to manage the growing population of asymptomatic patients diagnosed, and this will no doubt be the focus uh, of a variety of studies in the near future. Thank you very much for your time.